Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 631, The Villagey. The steeple's base was paved with black stone bricks, and a colossal pillar rose proudly. Lumian felt like a visitor in a giant's kingdom as he strode through the expansive and dimly lit space. The occasional tall residents who effortlessly towered over him only heightened this impression. Guided by the signs on the wall, he ascended to the third floor, revealing rows of imposing bookshelves. The custodian of the library, an elderly man draped in a linen robe, oversaw the space. Even seated, he matched Lumian's height, and his slightly gray skin bore the marks of age. Engrossed in a goatskin-bound book, the library administrator paid no heed to Lumian's entrance, his gaze firmly fixed on the text. Lumian, not rushing to seek permission for his exploration, entered the library and followed the guidelines posted on each row of bookshelves leading to the section housing mythical books. He ran his finger over the weathered leather-bound book and another with freshly copied pages, choosing a tome that chronicled creation myths. Before the bookshelf, Lumian casually flipped through its pages, only to stuff the book back. He couldn't comprehend it. The words were in Jotun. This ancient language, associated with the Bayonda race of giants, possessed the ability to manipulate the forces of nature. Ranked alongside Dragonese, Elvish, and ancient Hermes, Jotun held significant importance in mysticism. Although Lumian had mastered ancient Hermes and Hermes, Jotun remained a language he recognized but hadn't fully mastered. He could barely decipher the title of the ancient book, but couldn't comprehend its contents. A sweep of his gaze revealed a corresponding copy of the ancient book, this time written in ancient Faisak, a human language devoid of supernatural influence. Joy surged within Lumian as he retrieved the soft-covered book and settled into the reading area near the window. Throughout the entire process, no one intervened or issued a warning. This library is entirely open to everyone. Even those not residing in the new city of Silver can peruse its contents, but borrowing seems to be off the table. Or perhaps the knowledge on this level isn't deemed confidential, Lumian mused, maintaining a steady pace. He strolled past the section dedicated to Bayonder creatures, and his keen eyes snagged a book titled Devilology. Devilology. Recalling recent encounters, Lumian snagged the corresponding copy. In the reading area, he chose a spot shielded from direct sunlight, yet bathed in ample illumination. Seated, he delved into the pages of Devilology. As he read, Lumian's eyes widened, and his mouth hung slightly ajar. He murmured to himself, is it really acceptable to have this kind of knowledge available to the public? Each piece of information was invaluable. The Devilology book meticulously outlined the traits and behaviors of creatures from various species after transforming into devils. It also provided detailed analyzes of devils with distinct personalities within the same species. For those potentially facing Bayonders of the Devil Pathway in combat, the value of this book rivaled that of a potent Grade II sealed artifact or its corresponding mystical item. Moreover, how did the new City of Silver come by such knowledge? It's improbable they could compile creature illustrations without dispatching hundreds of devils. Could it be that the half? Giants and giants here are devil hunters? Perhaps in ancient times, when devils were more active, they shared information with other factions. Lumian grew more alarmed as he read on. Midway through, he massaged his throbbing temples, sensing a rapid depletion of his spirituality. Lumian temporarily closed Devilology, intending to explore the creation myths of the new city of Silver and take a well-deserved break. From the very outset, the creation myth read, The omnipotent and omniscient God created everything before slipping into a profound slumber. Among the mythical races he brought into being, Giant King Almir, Dragon of Imagination Anquelt, Elf King Saniathrim, Vampire Ancestor Lilith, Devil King Farbody, Phoenix Ancestor Gregrace, Mutant King Kavaster, and King of Demonic Wolves Phlegria emerged as potent and crazy beings. They partitioned the authority left by the Lord, transforming into ancient deities governing the sky, land, sea, reality, the spirit world, and the astral realm. Abruptly, a dull-skinned, slightly gray finger tapped a specific spot on the page. 
an aged, raspy voice echoed. Do not utter this name in any Bayonder language. Lumian looked up, surprised to find the library administrator, previously immersed in his books, standing beside him seemingly out of nowhere. As a hunter, Lumian remained oblivious, partly due to the lingering dizziness from reading Devilology. It showcased the library administrator's proficiency in concealing both breath and movement, given his towering stature of more than three meters. Lumian redirected his attention to the name indicated by the library administrator. Devil Monarch Farbody. Without awaiting Lumian's inquiry, the library administrator, bearing giant-like traits, shifted his finger a few centimeters and remarked, it's advisable to avoid pronouncing this name in any Bayonder language as well. Lumian followed the motion of the finger, silently noting the corresponding name in his mind. Vampire Ancestor Lilith. Why am I not allowed to read about it? Lumian expressed his ignorance without reservation. The library administrator spoke in a deep voice, the devil monarch is still alive. This formidable ancient deity remains among the living. And the vampire ancestor is suspected to be alive as well. In recent times, an individual in the city experienced disturbances after uttering the name Lilith in Jotun. Although their life wasn't at risk, they endured prolonged suffering. Ancient deities, Entities that once governed the world before the ancient sun god's era? Lumian recalled fragments of his limited knowledge and inquired thoughtfully, Did the ancient sun god rescue humanity from the dominion of these ancient deities? The library administrator, towering at more than three meters, turned to the last page and pointed. Lumian read the description. The omnipotent and omniscient god stirred from slumber, rising from the earth to vanquish the ancient deities and reclaim his authorities. Note, in the present era, the omnipotent and omniscient god is also known as the ancient sun god. Indeed, among the eight ancient deities, devil monarch Farbody is still alive, vampire ancestor Lilith is suspected to be alive, and the rest have perished. Giant King Omir, why does that name sound familiar? Ah, the provincial capital renowned for its red wine and champagne. What ties does it share with the giant king? Lumian cautiously inquired, Can these two names be pronounced in ordinary human language? The vampire ancestors is acceptable, but it's advisable to refrain from attempting the devil monarchs. You must exercise caution even in writing it, responded the colossal library administrator. We are uncertain if the Devil Monarch possesses any special abilities. Exercise caution even in writing, are all demons like this? Yes, the deity of the Devil Pathway remains alive, an ancient being since the second epoch. Lumian murmured, his heart stirred. He retrieved a note with the love incantation from his traveler's bag. Have you encountered this name before? I came across a demon who identified itself as this. Much like the others, it cannot be spoken or written, only thought. The library administrator accepted the note with a hand capable of engulfing Lumian's head. His gaze swept over the name, Nabordisly. He lapsed into deep contemplation. After a minute or two, he silently retrieved a copy from a concealed location within the bookshelf. The book's title read, A Summary of Rumors and Hearsay Before the Cataclysm One. What a simple name, Lumian observed as the library administrator opened the newly acquired book, pointing at a particular line of text. As anticipated, it's right here. Lumian fixed his gaze and read silently. After the devil monarch Farbody led the devils back to the abyss, occasional rumors persisted of demons enticing humans. The demons operated under the following names. Bealbubbly, Almos, Samael, Lilitan, and Nabordisli. A high-ranking demon hunter speculated that these names conceal the aliases of Devil Monarch Farbody. The Devil Monarch Farbody's alias, Lumian felt a jolt as a thin layer of sweat coated his back. Could Nabordisli be the Devil Monarch? The sealed blood-colored demon was the Devil Monarch. No, it doesn't seem likely. If it were a genuine ancient deity, catching just a glimpse of his form wouldn't have resulted in my eyes exploding in a dream. I would have lost control immediately. Yes, perhaps Farbody's pseudonym is among these names, but it doesn't necessarily mean Nabordisli is him. 
Lumian wiped his forehead with his right hand, forcing a smile as he addressed the library administrator, as a foreigner, am I truly allowed to read these books? The knowledge they contain is exceedingly precious. The library administrator responded calmly, the chief has already informed us that you are Mr. Fool's Blessed. Very well. Lumian found it amusing. Apparently, not every foreigner could access this library. The library administrator offered no further warnings. He took the book chronicling pre-cataclysm rumors and departed from Lumian's vicinity. Lumian continued to alternate between reading devilology and creation tales, taking breaks as needed. As evening approached, he barely concluded both books and departed from the Twin Towers. Releasing his compressed spirituality, Lumian teleported back to the berries in Port Hanth. Surveying the still bright sky, Lumian confirmed that the investigation into Hanth Island's demon legends had reached its conclusion. The matter delved into complexities beyond his reach. He no longer hesitated about his next steps and plans. Since he hadn't fully digested the Conspirer potion, he resolved to head to West Balaam and seek out Hisoka. There, he would hunt to digest the potion and complete the advancement ritual. Chapter 632 Conspiracy Late at night in Trier, Ungulame de Franiswas sat in front of a small analyzer and a radio transceiver, attentively listening to the clicks and observing as a translated telegram was produced by a mechanical typewriter. The signature above simply read Hidden Blade. Having exchanged a few messages, Angoulême remained composed. He picked up the telegram and swiftly skimmed through its contents. Um, when you're protecting high-ranking government officials and members of parliament daily, do you tail them even during personal moments like affairs or trips to the washroom? A wry smile formed on Angoulême's face. He contemplated responding to Hidden Blade with, what occupies your thoughts all day? However, in the blink of an eye, his eyes narrowed as he tapped away on the mechanical typewriter. Tell me, what crime do you intend to commit? Which high-ranking government official or member of parliament is your target for assassination? Damn it! Franca, seated in the master bedroom of her apartment, squirmed uncomfortably. Why did it feel like she was undergoing police interrogation? She dryly chuckled to herself and replied on the mechanical typewriter. I'm just curious. Following them would be awkward and not doing so might expose a security vulnerability easily exploitable by others. She refused to acknowledge any plans involving the Minister of Industry in the current government. After a while, Zo7 sent a new telegram. I rarely undertake such missions. Initially, I dealt with Bayonder incidents and battled cultists. Later, I got promoted and no longer had to participate in daily protection operations. Based on my knowledge and limited experience, we have to follow the protectee wherever they go. If they choose to have an affair, at least one of us will discreetly stand by the coat rack, keeping a watchful eye. If time allows, we'll investigate and confirm the identity and background of the target in advance. If the protectee enters the washroom, one of us waits by their side guarding against potential threats from sewers, ventilation pipes, and shadows. However, there's an exception. If the protectee strongly requests and writes an exemption, we can respect their privacy. After all, we're not their parents obligated to protect their every move. If they perish, someone else will take their place. It's not easy to find a three-legged toad, but those aspiring to be high-ranking government officials and members of parliament can fill Avenue du Boulevard. Moreover, such officials and MPS don't often possess exceptional foresight and wisdom. What matters is the position they hold, not the individual. Very few high-ranking officials and MPS choose to write exemptions for privacy, but they tend to do so when discussing confidential matters with their team. A 7. Did you work overtime so much that you harbor resentment? Franca chuckled inwardly. She felt that Zo7 wasn't as laid back as she would have liked. If it were the two members from Lone, they would likely say, it's fine if most high-ranking officials who don't deal with real matters or MPS who only give speeches are dead. Even curly-haired baboons in their positions would perform better. At least the baboons wouldn't smack their heads to formulate policies or work for personal gain. 
they wouldn't boast about their wisdom and desire to show off. They'd simply enjoy bananas and play happily. That's the least harmful thing for the entire country. Franker read O7's telegram again and turned to Jenna, who was sitting by the bed. The protective measures are tight and there are no loopholes to exploit. Yes, that's the case with the purifiers. The machinery hive mind and Bureau 8 should be similar. Franca, Jenna, and Anthony had been gathering information for a while and had devised several plans, but they still found it unsafe and uncertain. Hence, they consulted Zoe 7, seeking clarification on the security situation around Morin Avigny. Being a cabinet minister of a country, Morin Avigny was not an easy target for assassination. Moreover, Franca and the other's primary goal was an assassination. Even if they considered it, they had to factor in the time required for spirit channeling, making it even more troublesome. Listening to Franca's summary of Zu Seven's response, Jenna pondered for a moment and said, if it were any other demoness, they might choose to sacrifice their established legitimate identity by seducing Morin Avigny and pretending to be shy to make the minister get an exemption from the protectors. However, I don't think that's feasible. Morin Avigny is likely a mirror person, and mirror people have a close relationship with the demoness pathway. They might be especially wary of a demoness approaching them. Franca had initially hesitated to involve Jenna in the operation against Morin Avigny because the demoness of Black Claris would secretly monitor and provide assistance at critical moments. It would be risky if she discovered Jenna using the demoness pathway's abilities. However, Jenna insisted on participating. Her reasoning was, after Franca admitted to Claris that she hadn't experienced pleasure for a long time, the demoness of Black would likely suspect her relationship with Franca. After all, Franca had approached Brown Sauron under the guise of attending a female orgy. Therefore, Jenna wanted to showcase a vampire's abilities and combat style in front of the demoness of Black. The mystical item she currently possessed would allow her to disguise herself effectively and maintain sufficient combat strength. The prerequisite was that she had to conceal the arrow of the bloodthirsty well and hide it under her clothes. As for mirror substitution, she could explain it away with Franca since Anthony had one too. Franca had muttered, demonesses can also have pure love, but as she finished speaking, she awkwardly changed the topic and tacitly allowed Jenna to participate. Hmm. Franca, sitting cross-legged, nodded slightly and said, Morin Avigny's strength is unknown. He might be very formidable. If we attempt to seduce him, we risk becoming his prey if he's vigilant, possibly even losing our lives. Sigh, I'd better write to Lumian and see what he thinks. Franca chuckled self-deprecatingly. Ever since he left Trier, my brain seems to have gone on vacation. She was mocking her past laziness, acknowledging that she often delegated the primary responsibility of thinking to Lumian while playing a supporting role. Jenna chuckled and said, You're really good at self-deprecating. That's what I admire most about you. You're open-minded and cheerful. Franca chuckled. Teasing can liven up the atmosphere and foster closer relationships, but sometimes, if you can't gauge others' acceptance, teasing can easily turn into mockery. It's safer to make a self-deprecating remark. As the two demonesses conversed, a telegram clattered in. It was still from Zao 7. Franca's eyes lit up as she read the telegram. The telegram read, Hidden Blade, if you disclose your target and provide sufficient reason, I might be able to offer assistance and discreetly cooperate with your actions. Wow, what a bro. Franca praised inwardly as her fingers swiftly moved over the mechanical typewriter. Here's the deal. I currently possess ample evidence to believe that the Minister of Industry Morin Avigny is a mirror person who has infiltrated Trier and assumed the original owner's identity for decades. Haha, I didn't reveal this earlier because I needed to acquire crucial information from Morin Avigny. If he's captured by you, I can't guarantee that you'll gain access to pertinent information, so I plan to take action myself. Phew, there's hope. Franca turned around and joyfully raised her right index and middle fingers to Jenna. Before long, Zeus 7 responded. 
Gather the results of your previous investigations and more in Avigny's information promptly and place it at the designated contact point. I'll verify it first and find an opportune moment. Await my further instructions. Franca's face lit up with joy. She pursed her lips and sent a brief telegram. It's highly likely that a demigod of the demoness sect will be involved in this operation. Exercise caution. Jenna read it quietly and asked thoughtfully, Are we still seeking Lumian's opinion? Yes, Franker replied without hesitation. As the saying goes, three smelly cobblers are as good as Roselle. With more people brainstorming, we may uncover better solutions. What kind of proverb is that? Why haven't I heard it before? Jenna suspected that Franco was making it up. The crimson moon remained unseen, with only the stars casting a faint glow. Seated in the Barry's first-class suite, Lumian perused Dutany's textbooks when his messenger, Penitent Baneful, abruptly materialized before him. Baneful, draped in a black clergyman's robe, resembling a charred corpse, handed over the letter. Lumian caught it, inhaling the lingering fragrance on the paper. Franca's letter, Jenna even held and read it. Lumian made a casual judgment as he observed his messenger curiously. He had a persistent feeling that penitent baneful harbored many untold stories, but every attempt to engage in conversation was met with stoic silence. After Baneful traversed into the spirit world, Lumian unfolded the letter, reclined in his chair, and leisurely read. With Zhu Seven's help, this shouldn't be difficult. Lumian smiled suddenly and whispered to himself, if it doesn't work out, they can force the bait. Focus on the mirror person's wariness of demonesses and the potential strength they possess to lure him. When Morin Avigny believes the target is a bait from the demoness sect, with a demigod hiding behind her, planning to take the poison pill and retreat to deliver a bomb, he'll find himself facing one or two angels, three to five demigods. However, this way, Franca's demoness sect mission will be finished. Lumian's thoughts raced as he crafted and discarded one plan after another. Tomorrow, the berries would depart from the Berserk Sea, sailing into the southern continent's waters. When the time came, the ship wouldn't need to navigate complex twists and turns to avoid storms, maelstroms, and mystical phenomena. It could head directly for its destination port in West Balam. Suddenly, Lumian sensed something and stood up. Approaching the window, he peered out. In the darkness not far away, an ancient three-masted sailboat sailed silently. There were no lights on the ship and no one strolled on the deck. Chapter 633, West Balam. Lumian had heard from Lugano that ships deviating from the safe sea route might mysteriously disappear. In a few years, they would occasionally appear at night with no lights or people. This seemed to be the case now. In the past, Lumian might have teleported over out of curiosity, taking advantage of the three-masted sailboat's re-entry into a safe sea route to assess its internal condition. However, after encountering the demon legends on Hanth Island, he felt that less curiosity was better. As long as the uninhabited ship traveling in the darkness didn't exhibit signs of attack or an imminent danger, he could treat it as a unique spectacle of the Berserk Sea and simply observe. The brown ship gradually distanced itself, leaving only the billowing sails in its wake. Abruptly, Lumian, utilizing his exceptional vision, spotted a face silently staring out of an open hole in the cabin's uppermost window. The face, shriveled and pale white, clung tightly to the bones, devoid of flesh and blood. Flaxen-colored hair cascaded like withered weeds, the eyeballs were absent, leaving only a void of deep darkness. It resembled the head of a desiccated corpse, yet its lips were surprisingly vibrant, as if recently adorned with lipstick. Lumian instinctively sensed the face belonged to a woman. At least, she had been a woman when alive. He refrained from raising his right hand for a warm greeting. Instead, he quietly observed as the ancient three-masted sailboat sailed beyond the safe sea route and into the dark night. The desiccated face, with blood-red lips and pitch-black eyes, blended into the darkness. Only then did Lumian wave his hand and offer a faint smile. Goodbye, you won't be missed. He then helped Franca and the others to devise a plan to confront Morin Avigny. 
Ultimately, he opted to await further information from Zhu Seven before finalizing their strategy. Conspirer wasn't a visionary, known for conjuring conspiracies out of thin air, they required substantial information as a foundation. When Lumian awoke at dawn, the berries emerged from the dense, death-carrying fog of the Berserk Sea. Before him stretched a clear blue sea, bathed in the intense sunlight of the high sky. The next day, the berries bypassed Baron's Harbor at the northernmost tip of West Balaam. Instead, they continued southwest, reaching Port Pylos by 4 p.m. Situated in Matani, the port was under the rule of Admiral Quirrell. Originally a colony of the Intis Republic, Port Pylos saw Intis colonists withdraw after the war a few years ago. Subsequently, various factions from the Fainapotter Kingdom, maintaining a favorable relationship with Admiral Quirrell, took control. Lumian's target, Hisoka, was yet to surface in Port Pylos, but Lumian knew that the two pranks he had engaged in were in Matani. One occurred in Tizimo town, at the outskirts of Port Pylos, closest to the forest, and the other in Devise, the southernmost gold mine city in Matani. As Lumian unbuttoned the second button on his linen shirt, he remarked to Lugano in a self-deprecating tone. I feel like I'm shunned by winter and have been living in a scorching environment. Having arrived in Port Santa during late autumn, which was relatively hot and sunny, Lumian moved on to Port Kala as Port Santa began to cool. His journey continued through what his sister called the tropics, devoid of winter and maintaining a temperature of at least around 20 degrees Celsius. While Trier was already in midwinter, the southern continent was experiencing the height of summer. This made Lumian's specially prepared black tweed coat and Jaman-styled trench coat impractical. Because we've been traveling south all autumn, Lugano declared authoritatively on matters of weather and seasons. Lumian donned a golden straw hat and strolled down the gangway to the port, hand in hand with Ludwig. He boldly embodied the traits of the adventurer Louis Berry. Initially, Lumian had contemplated altering his strategy, adopting a new identity to discreetly investigate the two pranks in Matani and uncover Hisoka without drawing attention. However, after Franca vividly detailed Hisoka's usual characteristics to Anthony Reed, the hypnotist's profiling revealed an exceptionally aggressive trait ranking among the top. As a result, Lumian reconsidered and returned to his role of casting out bait. Yet, he couldn't shake the feeling that success was a slim possibility. The sea sacrificial ritual and Loki's survival had likely provided Hisoka with a comprehensive understanding of the factions backing him. April Fools, with its former display of resources and energy, seemed ill-equipped to challenge the might of the Tarot Club. And Lumian wasn't solely relying on the Tarot Club for support. If he were in Hisoka's shoes, Lumian would opt for patience. He'd wait a month or two, allowing the vengeful enemy to grow restless and make mistakes. When the formidable forces behind him could no longer guarantee protection, he'd launch a surprise attack. For now, let's not devise a plan. I'll consider it when I find clues, Lumian muttered to himself. Leaving the port alongside a throng of passengers, he reached the public carriage stop. Numerous rental carriages and pitch black or vermilion coffins were parked nearby. Coffins? Despite having read many travelogue books on West Balaam's customs, Lumian found it absurd to witness coffins lining the roadside. Before the invasion of the northern continent, before East and West Balaam's division, the Balaam Empire revered death, the emperor of the underworld from the War of the Four Emperors. Thus, the locals valued and loved coffins, considering them objects that brought peace, tranquility, and the blessing of death. When traveling, they would lie inside, carried by people or pulled by horses and single-horned goats. Of course, this form of transportation was reserved for those of a certain wealth level. Ordinary people couldn't even afford lying in a coffin. After a momentary daze, Lumian addressed Lugano and Ludwig with interest. Do you want to take the coffin? I plan to give it a try. I I'll pass, Lugano replied, finding the idea of lying in a coffin unsettling. Ludwig shifted his attention to the nearby street vendors. The aroma of corn and potatoes intertwined, enticing every passerby and prompting increased saliva production. 
How lame, Lumian teased with a smile. Approaching the four locals with disheveled black hair and dark brown skin, he raised his right hand and pointed at the pitch-black coffin beneath the shade of a tree. How much? Lugano inquired in fluent Dutonese before Lumian could. His linguistic talent was evident. Less than a month had passed since their departure from Port Santa to their arrival at Port Pylos, and he could already communicate with people in Dutonese. Of course, his proficiency was limited to basic words and short sentences. A half-naked local in linen pants replied in Dutonese. Nearby, forty copet, far away, one verl door. Recognizing the foreigner's inquiry, he refrained from quoting the price in the local currency, Delexi, the intision term for copper coins. Quite affordable. This coffin, carried by four people, should be considerably cheaper than the one carried by eight. Lumian mused, appreciating the direct use of Verl Dor and Coppet. It showcased the recent intision influence in the former colony, lost only a few years ago. Lumian's grasp of Dutonese surpassed Lugano's, thanks to the mid-level language comprehension charm he had used on the ship. Learning Dutonese in this manner proved more efficient. Regarding charm consumption, Lumian harbored no concerns. In his view, items served a purpose, and there was no concept of waste as long as they proved useful. He couldn't align with those miserly individuals who hoarded their wealth throughout life, only for it to benefit others after their demise. If he urgently needed language comprehension charms, he could acquire them from the curly-haired baboon's research society. If their gathering didn't align with his schedule, teleporting to various cities in Lenberg would allow him to purchase them from the Church of Knowledge. Sure, Lumian nodded at Lugano and said, let's go to Hotel Arella. After Lugano paid one verl door, the local who had quoted the price lifted the thin coffin lid, revealing the interior covered with thick dark red cloth and a stiff neck pillow. Excitedly, Lumian removed his golden straw hat and lay down, immediately feeling a cooling sensation enveloping his body. In the hot season, the coffin effectively dispelled the humidity. Is it the coffin's wood or the sun screening black paint or perhaps the shade of the tree? It feels like stepping into a morgue in the summer surprisingly comfortable. Lumian observed the thin coffin lid closing, witnessing the shadows rapidly expanding until they dominated his world. Outside, the voices became muffled in his ears. The coffin was lifted, swaying slightly as it moved forward. Within Lumian's view, everything was dark, and his surroundings exuded a sinister, cold ambience. For some reason, it felt like he was walking toward death, touching it. Setting aside the psychological discomfort, it isn't bad. The only downside is the tendency to easily fall asleep. Lumian evaluated the mode of transportation in a good mood. It's unsuitable for mixed gender rides, which could be more awkward. Ha! <sighs> I wonder if the romantic intisions have ever engaged in an affair under such circumstances. Nearly half an hour later, the coffin halted in front of Hotel Orella. Lumian stepped out, finding himself in front of a small man. Maid Valley. Rows of grayish-black stone rooms encircled the inner wall of the deep valley until reaching the bottom. This was Port Pylos's most renowned Hotel Orella. Originally belonging to a Balaam royal family descendant Orella Eggers, it had been constructed with the intent of approaching death. Later, it fell into the hands of Intis colonists. Upon the Phanipaterians' arrival, they perceived it as a symbol of entering the earth and returning to the land, prompting its transformation into a sizable hotel. Chapter 634 Fresh Off the Boat in the well-lit lobby of Hotel Orella, above ground, Lugano effortlessly balanced Ludwig, munching on a burrito in one hand and clutched his suitcase in the other. His eyes darted around uneasily. From his adventurous beginnings to trailing Lumian South, he'd never lodged in a place proudly declaring itself a hotel instead of a motel. He'd only encountered Trier's renowned Grand Champs Elysee in newspapers and magazines, learning that its construction cost a whopping 21 million Verl d'Or. With 800 rooms and 65 functional halls, even the most basic accommodations demanded 12 Verl d'Or per day in the off-season. A stark contrast to Lugano's usual frugal 3-5 Verl d'Or weekly motel stays. 
the bustling metropolis of Trier had left an indelible mark on Lugano, urging him to rise above and recommend himself to Lumion. Accumulating wealth, obtaining potion ingredients, and advancing to doctor became his priorities. He aspired to join the ranks of high society. Only when he became a doctor did he grasp the vastness of the Bayonder world. He had barely scratched its surface. The male receptionist, sporting curly black hair, dark brown skin, and a keen countenance, addressed Lugano in fluent intision. Would you prefer a suite or a standard room? Are you inclined towards a coffin bed or a conventional one? Lugano glanced at his employer. Lumian toyed with a caramel-colored East Balaam cigarette wrapped in roasted tobacco leaves, bringing it to his nose for a gentle sniff. He savored the blend of tobacco leaves, internal spices, and assorted herbs. The aroma was mildly invigorating and redolent, tempting one to inhale deeply. A sweet, standard, and closer to ground level. Lumian had sampled rental coffins for transportation and had no plans to continue sleeping in them. It wasn't a traumatic experience, but it did alter his perception of his surroundings. In case of an attack, it could impede his initial response. Lugano sighed in relief upon hearing Lumian's decision and conveyed the employer's request to the male receptionist. Eight verl door a day, three days payment in advance, the native male receptionist stated the price. After Lugano completed the payment, the receptionist, with a nod to his colleagues, said obsequiously, I'll escort you down. Three mechanical elevators stood at the back of the hall. Lumian and his group entered the middle door, pulling the brass handle to B3. Chains tightened, gears clamped, and various metal parts started to operate with resonating sounds. In the distance, it resembled the roar of a boiler, and white steam billowed out. As the mechanical elevator descended, the native receptionist glanced at Ludwig and smiled at Lumian. Settling down in Port Pilos, are you? If you need info on local grammar schools and rentals in different communities, feel free to approach me. In his view, anyone bringing a seven- or eight-year-old child to the southern continent was likely moving, not merely traveling. After all, the child was too young for perilous long-distance journeys. Moving meant finding a house renting or buying and choosing a good school. These were all opportunities to make money. At the mention of school, Ludwig, munching on a roasted corn cob, suddenly stopped chewing, as if the food had lost its fragrance. Lumian wasn't oblivious to the native receptionist's thoughts, but didn't mind. Instead, he admired the man's shrewdness. He grinned and remarked, I'll take a look first. We haven't confirmed if we would stay in Port Pylos. At that moment, the mechanical elevator halted at B3. Entering the room on the right, with a stone fence on one side and the cold valley aisle on the other, Lumian addressed the native receptionist, Do you know Tizimo Town? The native receptionist, aiding Lugano with the suitcase, slightly bent and led the way. I do. Many gentlemen head to Tizimo on weekends for forest hunting. There are secret temples and mausoleums left behind by former nobles in the forest. If you want to have fun, don't venture too deep. The primitive tribes there are barbaric and savage. Lumian nodded, not probing further. Upon reaching Suite 7 and entering the living room, he casually tossed a verl door silver coin to the native receptionist. What's your name? The receptionist, pleasantly surprised, responded, You can call me Ron. Lumian chuckled. I might have to trouble you often in the future. For example, what's the name of the nearest and better bars? Where is it? Ron touched the silver coin and smiled. It's my honor to assist you. Head to the man eating flower bar. Intision is used for communication there. It's on the street behind our hotel. Lumian instructed Lugano and left the room with Ron waiting for one of the mechanical elevators. Inside, a man with a deathly pale face and vacant eyes stood. The man's face was deathly pale and his eyes were vacant. He wore a wrinkled shirt and pants. Lumian glanced at him without a word. Amidst the tightening of the chain and the relatively stable elevation, the mechanical lift returned to the ground. Once the vacant-eyed man exited the lift and distanced himself from them, Ron leaned closer to Lumian and whispered, 
I wanted to remind you to pretend not to see that customer. Who is he? Lumian asked casually. Ron glanced around and lowered his voice. He resides in a suite at B-18, a servant of Mr. Ivolchta. That gentleman's servants don't seem normal. Of course, it's not normal. They are walking corpses, Lumian criticized. He had already observed the servant and realized his fate was dark and that of a deceased. Lumian wasn't surprised to encounter such a situation in a country that once worshipped death. Having already seen the Blood Emperor's afterimage, encountering a zombie was hardly shocking. In the sweltering evening, Lumian bypassed the artificial deep valley where Hotel Aurelis stood and entered a street with an unpronounceable name. He spotted a bar adorned with an exaggerated man eating flour. Donning a golden straw hat, he lit the East Balaam cigarette purchased from the hotel lobby and placed it between his lips. Cough, 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 Lumian quickly coughed, emitting white smoke from his nose. His intention was to showcase his experience as an experienced adventurer by smoking East Balaam cigarettes, but he hadn't anticipated their potency. As someone who rarely smoked, he found it unbearable. In Cordu, various cheap alcohols abounded, but cigarettes were scarce. Lumian had only witnessed Pons Bainet, Louis Lund, and a few others indulging in smoking. After extinguishing the East Balaam cigarette and tossing it into the trash can, Lumian entered the bar and skillfully approached the counter. He pulled up a bar stool and settled in. Sensing the lingering smoke in his mouth, he opted for something milder. He tapped the counter and spoke in intision, a glass of Kilju, the regular kind. Ten licks, replied the bartender, a local man in a white shirt and black vest, his intision tinged with a distinct accent. Lumian settled the bill and awaited the bartender's pour. He discreetly surveyed the area, noticing nobody paying him any heed except for a dozen wanted posters adorning the bar's wall. Thoughtfully accepting the amber-colored kilju, he adjusted his golden straw hat and addressed the bartender with a smile. Do you know who I am? The bartender glanced at him and smiled back. Every now and then, a self-proclaimed renowned adventurer poses that question but I'm sorry, I don't know you. From the looks of it, the adventurer Louis Berry's exploits in hunting the demon warlock are primarily known in the Fog Sea. My rising fame was tied to activities within the Church of Earth Mother's sphere of influence. Louis Berry's reputation waned upon entering the Berserk Sea, and few in West Balam are familiar with him. If Hisoka isn't stationed at the docks every day, he likely doesn't know about my arrival in Port Pylos. Lumian refrained from erupting in rage at the bartender's words. He sipped his kilju, contemplating the situation. Noticing Lumian's silence, the bartender casually smiled and remarked, You just arrived in the southern continent, right? Yes, I left the Berserk Sea this morning. Lumian seamlessly assumed the role of a regular at all tavern, recounting his story with a smile. Encountered a ghost ship in the Berserk Sea, danced with dried corpses under the moon, and repelled a demon's attack. Praise the mother of all things. You might never understand how magical and dangerous the Berserk Sea is. The bartender wiped the glass's inner wall and interrupted Lumian. I know. After all, that's where death disappeared. Where death disappeared? Lumian asked in surprise. While he had speculated about the dangers of the Berserk Sea and abnormal weather being linked to a deity's demise, he hadn't expected such an easy answer. The bartender regarded Lumian with an expression that implied, You're actually a rookie. Have you never heard of the legend of treasures at sea? At the top is Death's Key. It said that at the end of the fourth epoch Death, who had lost the Pale White War, stirred violent waves to obstruct the returning enemy to Balaam, creating insurmountable obstacles that severed the northern and southern continents. However, he ultimately didn't return to his throne and vanished. Only those with the special key can find him, discover the treasures he left behind, and gain his boon. The bartender's tone was complicated. Lumian fell silent. He had embarked on the sea seeking revenge and held little interest in treasure legends. He hadn't anticipated missing such crucial information. Just then, the heavy wooden door of the bar creaked open. 
The once noisy bar hushed in an instant. Sensing the shift in atmosphere, Lumian turned his body, fixing his gaze upon the door. Chapter 635 Man Eating Flower At the entrance of the Man Eating Flower Bar, a figure strode in. A woman, neither towering nor petite, clad in a conservative, deep black dress, caught everyone's attention. Her eyebrows were meticulously drawn, her skin thickly powdered, and her cheeks adorned with noticeable blush. Her lips shone gorgeously, and the area around her eyes sparkled with gem-like hues. Despite the woman's excessive makeup and unconventional style, her captivating brown eyes, high nose bridge, luscious lips, and curvaceous figure emitted a potent charm. Male patrons in the bar shifted their gazes to the door, momentarily silent. Only when the woman acknowledged a few customers with an aloof nod did the atmosphere spring to life. Some attempted conversation, while others raised their voices at their companions, trying to make an impression on her. Without lingering, the woman navigated through the crowd and settled on the opposite side of the bar counter. Unique. If Franca were here, she'd surely strike up a conversation. Lumian felt a twinge of regret for his companion and averted his gaze. He smiled at the bartender and commented, That lady seems quite popular. The bartender wiped away the expression reserved for new adventurers and replied sternly, She's my boss. Boss. Lumian suddenly recalled the bar's name and asked thoughtfully, Man eating flour? It's her. The bartender lowered his voice and approached the beautifully made-up woman of indeterminate age. He poured her a glass of some unknown brand of black rand. After the bartender returned, Lumian asked curiously, Why does she have the nickname Man eating flour? She seems very popular. The bartender instinctively turned his head, observing his boss as she focused on her drink and surveyed the patrons nearby. Leaning in, he whispered. In Port Pylos, women of her caliber often relish the pursuit and adulation of men, but keep them at arm's length. Our boss, however, is different. If she takes a liking to you, she'll extend an invitation for a memorable night. Sometimes, we can hear her passion echoing through the halls upstairs. The bartender paused, a mix of nostalgia and desire evident on his face. Pleasure? Lumian subtly frowned and inquired with a smile, Have you ever been the object of her affections? The bartender fell silent. For a moment, Lumian wondered if the other would smash his head with the cup in hand. Changing the subject, Lumian asked, Aren't there brash men who try to force themselves on your boss? The bartender sighed and replied, Remember the name of our bar. Man eating flour, is that what it means? Lumian grasped the meaning. The bartender elaborated, those who tried to force themselves on our boss ended up badly. Some were severely injured or thrown down the stairs, others simply vanished. Even those who caught her, I would be pale the next day, legs unsteady. They couldn't walk properly. That's why she's called man eating flour. She embraces it. Eventually, she named the bar after it. This is a departure from the demonesses of pleasure's style, but each demoness has her own unique approach. Franca, a demoness of pleasure, stands out from the rest. Lumian's curiosity sated, he didn't delve further into the bar owner. Instead, he retrieved an ordinary deck of poker cards from his traveler's bag and asked, Have you come across anyone using poker cards as a weapon recently? According to Anthony Reed's analysis of Hisoka, a key member of April Fools, Hisoka had a strong inclination towards self-expression. After successfully creating the poker card with the ability to change its face, possessing frost and cut characteristics, it was clear he wouldn't limit its use to mere April Fools pranks. When engaged in combat or carrying out acts of violence, he wouldn't hesitate to employ the mystical item to end his target's life. This information presented a promising lead for investigation. Regarding the two pranks orchestrated by Hisoka, they revolved around Matani and were linked to relatively confidential or significant local affairs. Individuals who weren't locals or lacked prolonged residence wouldn't spontaneously choose this area unless they also possessed ample information to support their actions. Lumian reasonably suspected that Hisoka's original sphere of activity centered on Mitanni and its neighboring regions. 
This rationale prompted his journey to Matani, despite believing that Hisoka had likely heeded Loki's warning and evaded capture, concealing himself. Understanding Hisoka's past was crucial to deciphering his present and ending his future. The native bartender scoffed at Lumian's inquiry. Do you think I'd have that information? Consult the patrol team. Whether they choose to answer is another matter. Patrol team, Lumian didn't mind and nodded slightly. Established by Admiral Quirril, the ruler of Matani, the Among Beyonders. In this state, following the withdrawal of most Intis colonial forces, the Church of the Eternal Blazing Sun, the Church of God of Steam and Machinery, and the new Cathedral of the Church of Earth, Mother lacked official authority to enforce the law. While these churches maintained Beyonder teams in their cathedrals across different cities, their jurisdiction was limited to self-defense and safeguarding believers within the cathedral. They couldn't address matters akin to their usual spheres of influence or eliminate potential hidden dangers. Admiral Quirrell entrusted the corresponding authority to the newly formed patrol team. Some of the patrol team's Beyonders were veterans from Admiral Quirrell's army, while others were remnants of the former Balam Empire or former adventurers and bounty hunters. What a simple name, Lumian pondered for a moment as he glanced at the few wanted posters on the wall. Admiral Quirrell doesn't want adventurers turning Matani into a hunting paradise, he doesn't want them brawling on the streets under the guise of pursuing targets on wanted posters. The bartender shot Lumian a surprised look. You're quite sharp for an adventurer. In Matani, the wanted status is earned through crimes committed here. No one cares about your actions elsewhere. As expected of one of the adventure paradises, Lumian lifted the Kilju and finished it, just as he was about to switch to a glass of West Balam, specific liquor to savor its distinct flavors, he felt a gaze upon him. It was the owner of the man eating flower bar, the woman in the black dress with exquisite makeup. Lumian nodded calmly and shifted his focus back to the bartender. While this man-eating flower was undoubtedly attractive, she couldn't match a demoness in terms of feminine allure. Additionally, Lumian wasn't fond of heavy makeup. At that moment, the woman rose from her seat and sauntered over to Lumian. She curled her lips and remarked, I can sense that you're like me, a living volcano, but it hasn't erupted yet. You're still enduring and waiting in pain. Tonight, are you willing to feel my passion? Lumian raised his right hand and stroked his face. You're taken with me just like that. Come to think of it, I've been a hit with the ladies since my youth. Being a hunter, I've often found myself surrounded by all sorts of beauties. Could this be the subtle influence of the true men pathway? It doesn't add up. According to the adventurous series and recent sea rumors, Mr. Fool's Oracle Danitz is also from the Hunter Pathway, yet his romantic endeavors were fruitless, and he doesn't boast any notable female companions. Lumian muttered internally and stood up. He offered a smile and inquired, How should I address you? Balusha. The woman's smile relaxed, making Lumian feel that she might appear even more stunning without her heavy makeup. Lumian took off his golden straw hat, pressed it to his chest, and bowed slightly. Madam Belosha, I appreciate your invitation, but there's someone else I hold dear. As he spoke, he disregarded Belosha's slightly stiffened expression and made his way past the man eating flour, heading for the bar's entrance with composed demeanor. Belosha didn't stop him. Like numerous patrons in the bar, she observed as he swung open the sturdy wooden door and stepped out. As the wooden door thudded shut behind him, Lumian sneered and muttered to himself, I can resist even the charm of a demoness of pleasure. Why take the risk with a woman of unknown origins? Using someone I like as an excuse is already preserving your dignity. If you still seek revenge, I won't hold back. Having left the bar early, Lumian wandered through the nearby streets, exploring secluded alleys in hopes of stumbling upon incidents or criminals to gather information. After turning a few corners, he suddenly heard a clanging sound emanating from a dark and deserted alley. Silently, Lumian approached and delved into the alley. There, he witnessed an intense battle between two men. One, with evident native characteristics, appeared in his twenties. 
His face was pallid, and he wielded a sharp but hefty dagger in his right hand. His left palm was slightly open, and a dark shadow hovered in it, creating a chilling atmosphere. The other, in his early thirties, had ordinary facial features and an expressionless demeanor. Short, black hair framed his face, and his dark green eyes were encircled by white. Clad in a plain white shirt and black pants, he wielded longer, sharper weapons resembling scalpels in each hand. At this moment, the two engaged in a fierce battle, their weapons clashing rapidly, resonating with metallic clangs. Observing the skirmish, Lumian recognized that these weren't ordinary individuals. They both bore Bayonder characteristics. Halting his advance, Lumian nonchalantly stood with his hands in his pockets, his right foot propped up against the wall. He unabashedly observed the close-quarters combat between these Bayonders.